I'd like to welcome first welcome my panelists. We have Michael Rebell here from the formerly the Campaign for Fiscal Equity. So that's how long, how far we go back now. Um, he's the executive director now for the Center for Educational Equity here. Denora, who you met, thank you so much for grabbing me the mic. Uh, we also have Angelica Infante Green. Angelica. Hi. And Soma. Al Sayed, did I say that right? Al Sayed. Al Sayed, sorry I had it before. Okay, she's an 11th grader at the Young Woman Leadership School of Astoria. So we have students, commissioners, directors, um, a bunch of you with all kinds of different perspectives here about what exactly civics education is. Um, it's sort of interesting, I was thinking about this as I was listening earlier, um, as an education reporter, I travel the country a lot, I spend a lot of time in, in classrooms. I'm not hearing a lot about civics education at all. And I think to the points that were being made earlier, that's because it's lacking in many areas. At the same time, we're hearing so much about student voices rising up and anger at this election, anger at this administration, anger around gun control, and in general, a lot of dismay with our system. And yet, what are they actually learning in school? What kind of civics education are students getting? Each of you sort of has a different definition of how you view it and how you see the civic mission of our schools. So I'd love to, to start down here with Denora and ask a little bit about how you see it. Thank you. Uh, no, I have my phone. Thank you. Yep, and it's on. Good afternoon, everyone. There we go. We're still awake. We will have some treats a little bit later to get, get that sugar flowing before the breakouts. Uh, thank you, Liz, for being here with us today. Thank you, Michael and Joe and everyone at the center for partnering with us on this exciting conference today. I, I was joking earlier saying it was all a dream six months ago that we were going to actually have this conference, and now we're here today, and I'm thankful that we have such a good turnout to actually talk about the importance of civics. Um, you know, I think President Furman challenged us, uh, I was listening and taking notes, um, to think about a goal, right, us in the community that are doing this important work. And how do we actually define civics as a part of that, right? Because it is incumbent upon us as educators, as academics, as practitioners, to really think about what are the resources that teachers need for civics? Um, how do we actually ensure that all students are receiving an effective civics education? And most importantly, how do we assess that students are learning? And that's the work that we're doing at Generation Citizen. It's the work that I'm proud to lead on behalf of our New York City site. Um, that is one of six cities nationwide where Generation Citizen is implementing a new exciting pedagogy that we call Action Civics. So often at this point, I like sing, I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill. And you all know what that is, right? I mean, and it's not in any way pejorative or to be ageist, but that is not what we're doing at Generation Citizen. It is not what we mean when we talk about action civics. It is not what young people want to have in their classroom experiences, right? So when young people can like and hug and retweet things on the internet, we need to give them an action-oriented pedagogy, and that's the approach that we're using in our classroom. You, you want it to be very hands-on, is my understanding. Very project-based, action-oriented, um, and make sure that it's localized. And so six components, if I may, to what we mean when we talk about action civics. First, we want to make sure students are building, uh, or debating and building consensus around an issue that's personal and affects them. Because once we get the young people to actually realize that it matters to them and their community, then they're hooked. I was with one of our students last week and, or two weeks ago in the Bay, and she said, all the students start off the semester skeptical. Why are they here? What is Generation Citizen? Why do I have to take civics? And then once they realize that they actually have power, they have that sense of agency, that they can make a difference, as that young lady Ruba said, it's no longer a laughing matter, right? So we need to hook them. Then we want to make sure that young people are learning how to research and analyze the root cause of issues um, and developing an action plan, right? So it isn't just raising awareness or saying there's a problem in my community. It's actually empowering young people to take action to understand that they can affect change. Third, we want to make sure that they're putting that plan into action by directly engaging with decision makers and local influencers. Fourth, we want to make sure that they're presenting, so they're having that public speaking moment, that ability to connect with community leaders like yourselves, to talk about the power of their work and how they were civically engaged both in the classroom, but most importantly, how they're going to continue that civic engagement beyond. Uh, last but not least, when they get back to that classroom after we have this culminating event that we call Civics Day, which we hosted last week uh, for about 95 of our classrooms citywide, 
We want them to reflect and think about concrete ways to continue that project. So action civics isn't just that idea of a, in a classroom, it's not theoretical, it's real. So creating pathways for long-term civic engagement and making sure that they can reflect on how they can do that, both in the classroom with that specific project, but long-term. And that's the work that I'm excited to be working on at Generation Citizen. That's great. Um, Michael, how do you approach civic pr preparation? Well, um, From your perspective. yeah, I, I approach the issue of civic participation the way I approach many public policy issues, uh, which is from a legal perspective. Um, uh, as Liz knows, from uh, uh, we go way back to the CFE days, um, uh, I've been very involved in bringing a number of major education reform litigations. And the CFE case is the most important of all of them. Um, most people who know anything about CFE uh, think of the additional funding that uh, has come to students in New York City throughout New York State as a result of that case. We challenged the state system for funding public education. Uh, we got the court to say it's unconstitutional. We got a commitment from the state to increase funding by billions of dollars. We're more than halfway there. They still owe us. But what many people don't realize is there was another important dimension to CFE. And it's really uh, what brings me here today. And that is, uh, in trying to determine whether uh, at the present time, 15 years ago when we litigated the case, um, the schools in New York City had sufficient resources to provide kids their constitutional right to the opportunity for sound basic education, uh, the court said we've got to first determine what is a sound basic education. We can't consider uh, whether kids are getting it and whether the state's providing enough resources if we don't know what it is and it had never been defined. So um, we went into a major process as part of this uh, very lengthy litigation uh, to define what is a sound basic education. And the final definition, uh, a lot of interesting steps along the way, but the final definition that the highest court in New York State came up with in 2003 was that every kid in the state of New York has a constitutional right to an education that prepares them to function productively as civic participants capable of voting and serving on a jury. That is the essence of education as far as our state constitution is concerned. And you know what's fascinating uh, is when you go back in history, you go back to the founding fathers of the federal constitution. What did they think the purpose of an education was? Well, Sam Adams, uh, John Adams said at the time and wrote into the Massachusetts Constitution uh, that the purpose of education is to prepare kids to maintain this new experiment in democracy that we are instituting in 1776. You go back to the common school era, to Horace Mann. Why did he establish this uh, free public school system where uh, the children of the rich and the poor were supposed to uh, be educated together? It was because if we're going to be able to maintain a functioning, vital, civic uh, republic, uh, we have to educate all our citizens. So that's what education's about. And uh, unfortunately, um, we've lost the vision of how important that is and the role schools have to play in it. And you know, I spent the last two years doing a lot of thinking about this, a lot of researching, and wrote a book that we're hawking with a flyer out there. But along the way, I got into the question of why has there been a decline in the school's emphasis on civic participation? And some people think back to something like the 50s and 60s as being the golden age of teaching civics and all. And probably there, there were more courses being taught in those days, and there was a lot more emphasis on patriotism and civic values and all. Um, and you know, you can say it was the Vietnam War skepticism toward government institutions. You can say it's NCLB uh, and its emphasis on limited outcomes that are uh, gauged by standardized tests, that it's de-emphasized social studies and civics. All of that is true. But I'll tell you there's something else at work here. And that is, as much as we're talking about maintaining the original purpose of education, that goes back 225 years in this country, we're also talking about a terrific challenge for how to approach 
uh, what civic participation and civic education is in the 21st century. And we can't teach it the way we taught it in the 1950s. And somehow I think our teachers and our administrators and even our policy makers know that. And it's another reason they shy away from it. It's very difficult. How do you really pre uh, prepare teachers to teach controversial subjects in the diverse um, uh, populations we have, with the polarized political environment we live in, with the community flack they're going to get. Uh, but the fact is they need to do it. And how let's do you find out how a little bit, though, about okay. how that's happening in Selma Al Sayed's classroom in Astoria, because you are actually in a classroom where there is some teaching of this going on, and I'm very curious as to what you're learning and how it's, how it's going and um, how it's sort of integrated okay. into and the before whole Before I, I just turn it over to you, and, and I realized I was going on too far, I just wanted to give Denora and Generation Citizen some credit here. One reason we're proud to co-host this event with them is that they've taken on that challenge, and they're dealing with civic education in the 21st century, and I'd love to hear how your school is also. Thanks. Sorry to cut you off, Michael. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I go to a small all-girls school in Astoria, Queens, and um, the Young Women's Leadership School. Oh, the Young Women's Leadership School of Astoria. All uh, the way here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, our teachers have been teaching civic education in the classroom since day one, since I was in sixth grade, and we've really gone beyond the classroom. Okay. <laughs> Eat the mic. Okay. <laughs> Um, and so one thing we do is we do four corner debate where students are asked to move to different corners, um, whether it's when our teacher will present um, a scenario or a statement and ask us if we strongly agree, or strongly disagree, or agree or disagree. And we, and it's a lot, it, it creates this comfortable environment where students, it's not necessarily a debate, so they don't necessarily feel attacked for their beliefs, but they're able to justify them. Um, and really hear other students' perspectives. Um, one thing that we also do is we have these two weeks before winter break called intensives where all classes stop and every student is put into a certain intensive where they spend two full weeks um, working on a specific project. And in the past, we've, we've had one intensive called Extreme Makeover where students um, work to remodel a home that was next to our school for formerly incarcerated women. And they did this by approaching businesses and um, asking for grants and, um, and meeting with our councilmen. And so, you know, and they were able to remodel this home. Um, we've also worked with Verizon to, um, to have it in the classroom where students were um, asked to develop, develop solutions to certain issues that we're close to them and um, many students like me and a group of friends and I, we won a grant from Citizens Committee and to bring composting to our neighborhood. And so one thing that our school does that is completely different is not just teaching civic education in the classroom, but really giving us an opportunity to take action outside the classroom and, and that really um, makes a larger impact. Um, I'm also just curious, be, before we move on, how, how is it received? Are the students very receptive to this? Do you feel like this is an integral part of going to school every day and something that you wish other schools would be doing more of as well? Yes. Um, we talk about all these issues, about gun control, about abortion, about um, like Black Lives Matter in every single classroom, and it's not something that's regarded as like different, but students are more engaged in these conversations because they impact them. Um, my school, most of the students in my school, um, we, at, my school is a Title I school, and most of the students are um, minority students, and so these, you know, these topics really affect them, and so they tend to be very engaged. That's great. Angelica, let's hear a little bit about it from your perspective and what you wish we could be doing more of and how you define it. Sure. So, um, in agreement with everyone else, I think part of how the state defines it, I'm gonna take a few minutes just to read from you exactly from our social studies framework, how many of you know it from New York State? Okay, so some of you do. But the language is very powerful, mm -hmm. and I, I want you to understand, because as we look at other states, I think we are taking the lead in this area. And so I'm gonna to read to you what it says, and then I'm gonna tell you what we believe as a state and what we're, what we're doing as we move forward. So here's the language so that you have it. 
help young people make informed and reasoned reason decisions for the public good as citizens of culturally diverse, democratic society and in an interdependent world. That's pretty powerful if you think about it, right? Give students the tools to identify situations in which social actions require and determine an appropriate course of action. So it's not just kind of like a framework, but what do you do? How do you give to kids the tools? We heard on this panel that we have to do things differently, right? This is a new generation. We, we can't teach it in a way where the kids do, uh, don't feel empowered. And in order to do that, kids have to feel strong on who they are. So we have to start at the very beginning. Teach students how to work to influence those in positions. You hear the language? Very strategic. Influence those in positions of powers to strive for extensions of freedom, social justice, and human rights. Teach students how to demonstrate respect for, all, respect for the rights of others, respectfully disagree with other viewpoints, and provide evidence for the counter-argument. That sounds easy, but it is one of the most difficult things to do, especially in the classroom. And, Part of what we've been talking about as a state and with the guidance of the Board of Regents and our chancellor that you just heard is points of view matter and how do you bring that into the conversation? And we're, we have been talking about also biases that we have, that we bring into the classrooms. We've heard a lot about biases that have been brought in by educators, by students. How do you have those conversations in a very safe place? And we have a framework that actually enacts that for in the state of New York. That's it extremely crucial. So we understand that a strong democracy is dependent on active, informed citizenry. That's what we are working from that basis. And part of, of us doing that work is also creating a framework for cultural responsive and sustaining pedagogy in the state of New York. Because as we heard the critical issues that are embarking now that our students are having, how do you have that in a respectful manner that you can actually move forward? And what we have found is sometimes some of the policy that we have does not support the work that we're asking students to do in the classroom. That's the reality. So we are being very critical of what we have put in the past and we have looked at our framework and what is it that we have um, embarked on that may not be in alignment with what we're expecting schools to do. So that's really hard work, extensive work. Yeah, and that really brings up a question I have for, for all of you that I'd like to each take a, take a crack at. So there's a lot of agreement here in this room about the need for this and why it's important and, and what it looks like when it's done properly. Let's talk about the obstacles. What are the biggest obstacles in every situation to having a more um, idealized discussion, curriculum, uh, making sure the schools are following up, that, that students are actually learning what you want them to learn from this? You want to start, Angelica? So I think you know the, the obstacles that come to mind for me, I'll take from each of the stakeholders' perspectives, right? Um, for educators, it's I'm not being given the resources I need to teach project-based learning in my classroom. In fact, I was um, very happy to hear earlier, right? It isn't just this like surface level um, snorkeling that we need to be doing. We actually need to be taking the deep dive and giving educators the resources they need to teach this. Because I bet it's very intimidating, the notion of supporting nonpartisan student-led advocacy in the classroom. I'm a parent, right? It's terrifying at home when I think that I'm gonna institute democracy and don't know when I'm gonna get back on the other side. Yeah, I hear that a lot. <laughs> right? It's the reality, right? You're like, democracy's but, but over. But they also don't feel that they have the preparation or right. training, correct? Right, so that's, I think, a big <laughs> obstacle. For the young people, it's that this is also contrary to everything they're learning in the classroom, right? So they're not being given the resources to understand that their voices do matter, that they can engage in deep learning in the way that Salma's doing at the Young Women's Leadership School and actually come up with concrete solutions. Um, and more importantly, the ability to be able to research search these ideas and bring them to fruition. I think what is also hard is this notion of continuing and having that deep dive with the advocacy work. So it can't just be, like I said, I, we, go, we go into classrooms twice a week during school time and we're working with teachers, supporting them and giving them professional development on how to be able to implement project-based learning. What project-based learning is not is raising awareness about issues. So I don't want the hashtag and the quotable tweet I want to think about a deep dive on a project that's systemic in nature. So how do we do participatory action research and support students with coming up with proposed legislation that they want to see happen, supporting existing legislation, budgetary solutions, and ways to engage and lift up youth voice. That is substantive work that needs to happen in the classrooms, and I think to the extent that we can begin to forge, right, we've agreed that we're all on the same page, 
if we can begin to figure out the pipeline and the way to do that, support teachers statewide in the way that, I, you know, we've heard Mayor de Blasio talk about here in New York City of giving civics for all, that's when we're gonna turn the tide, right? We're gonna have this moment, uh, just before I finish, where we don't have young people who live in the most underserved communities feeling like their voices don't matter, but instead that they feel as lifted up, as, you know, supported as the young people who are leading in Parkland. And you're certainly not in every school. We're not in every school, nor can we How be in every school. How many are you in? So here in New York City, we're in 52 schools citywide, serving about 4,500 students. But that's a drop in the bucket, right? Yeah, there's, there's half a million. I think 1,500 <laughs> schools. Right, and there are half a million middle and high schools here in New York City, middle and high school students here in New York City. So we are only the tip of the iceberg, and that's why we begin to think about systemic policy change, and that's why we're starting this conversation today in partnership with Teachers College and the Center for Educational Equity. Fair enough. Michael, obstacles, you've probably seen okay. many. Yeah, well, I think the biggest obstacle is that um, <laughs> although everyone says uh, they believe in civic education, it's motherhood and apple pie, it's not a sufficient priority. That's the bottom line. And that's both in terms of resources and time and attention given to it. I just want to give you one quick experience we had. You know, I mentioned how impressed I was that our highest court emphasized civic participation as being the prime purpose of education. And we got a lot of extra funding. But you know, the 2008 a recession came along and all that extra money got cut. Many of you lived through that. We did a quick survey of uh, not only New York City, but seven other districts throughout the state to see what the impact of the recession was. And one thing we found that was amazing is the first thing to go when there was fiscal constraint and cutbacks was anything that had to do with civic education. You know, Chancellor um, uh, Rosa mentioned the importance of field trips, of experiential uh, learning, the things that Generation Citizen does, extracurricular, which the research says is the most directly causally correlated with later participation in civic activities of anything you do at school. All those things were cut first. And in many places, they haven't been put back. So um, we are pushing to have people aware this is a constitutional right. It should be a priority. But we're also wrestling with the fact when I talk with teachers and educators, again, everybody believes in this, but they're under so many mandates and there are so many hours in the day. And how do you fit the proper emphasis into these things? And quite frankly, I don't know all the answers to that. I don't know many of the answers to that. We're really happy that we're um, about to initiate a coalition of many groups, many of the groups in this room, as well as Generation Citizen and, and our other colleagues, and um, uh, many educators. And we really want to work with people throughout the state. And I'm very pleased that Angelica and the State Ed Department have been really uh, interested in this work and I think are really going to be cooperative. These are hard questions. And we really need to work together to figure out where to get the resources, where to get the time during the day, where to get the proper emphasis, and where to get the opportunities for our young people to do the kind of things that they're doing um, uh, so effectively at your school. And Selma, your school is, um, ha is only women, it's young women, and it's also leadership. So it's got emphasis on leadership, so clearly it's been made a priority. Do you have friends who go to other public schools and other schools where they're doing nothing like the kind, having, not having the kinds of discussions and learning that you're, that you're getting in your classrooms? I mean, definitely. I think most of, the, most of my friends that go to other schools aren't getting that type of learning. I think because their schools like they don't have an active role in their classroom environment. They're more like passive learners. They sit and they listen to the lecture and them not being like active in it would just make it so like such a strange transition to, to having to like being an advocate. Um, I also just think that one thing that our school does is it's very difficult for my students who are like minority students and like women, um, like participating in like local government and government in general just seems so foreign when you don't see yourself being represented. And I think that like our school being an all girls school and we have all these trips to meet powerful women, to meet Michelle Obama, and there, is these, there are these opportunities to, um, to make us you know, envision ourselves in those positions and take action. Angelica, you see lots of obstacles, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, I think all of the ones that were mentioned, but one of the things that we hear repeatedly is time, right? Where do we find the time? It, it's all about literacy and math, and, and we don't find the time for other subject areas. So one of the things that we just recently did was, aside from having our social studies framework, 
is also embedded into the standards, the ELA and the math standards that we just passed. That was extremely important for us, so that even though we have our framework, that it is embedded in the work that we're expecting across the board. But the challenge is definitely resources. I think that um, even and though we see the timing of the school day too. So well, yeah, it. that's what I was just saying. The time during the school day to find that, that's why we try to even embed it in, in the other standards so that it would be across the board. But I think one of the other things that how to have these conversations in a very difficult climate is a challenge. We can't ignore that. Mm -hmm. Teachers are getting in trouble for saying things or supporting things that the mainstream doesn't feel that they should be having those conversations. So when you don't have resources, when you don't feel you have the time, it hasn't been stressed enough, and then you're in a difficult climate, all of that put together is a huge challenge. And it's something that we're very aware of and plan to tackle in a very strategic manner that I'll talk a little bit about later, but we can't ignore that. We have teachers, we had a district upstate where a teacher was called upon by a parent because th they were talking about different political views. I mean, and that was very difficult for this teacher because now she feels silenced. And I think we have to acknowledge that we are not pushing the, the free speech that we want kids to have in a way that we're not supporting that in a very strategic manner at this point. It's a very charged atmosphere, yes. as you've said. How is it handled in, in your school? Um, you said it, it's sometimes difficult for the students. Do people feel free expressing views and voices? Are your teachers able to address the issues you want them to openly as they try and teach you these concepts? Yeah, well, I think our teachers do definitely do that. But the thing with our school is that most of the students are very liberal. So when we do have a few conservative students, um, like it's sometimes like they sometimes get shut down when there's like multiple people attacking their perspective. And that's why our teachers have focused more on having these four corner debates where students don't necessarily have to, like there's no back and forth where they have to constantly just justify themselves and have numerous people attacking them, where they just have to justify their opinion, but there isn't that like attack from the other side. Um, before we open up to questions from the audience, I'm gonna ask you each quickly to tell us what you think, if, if we could just do one thing to help schools prepare for, for the opportunity to give better civic education without maybe having necessarily all the resources and curriculum and the training you want. What one thing could we do in all schools? You know, what I wanted to uh, respond to your question, and it's really responding to what Angelica just said, um, it is a difficult, polarized, charged atmosphere. Um, and teachers are rightly apprehensive uh, about uh, doing what they need to do to teach controversial issues and get kids to open up. And one of the ideas that we have that uh, we hope to try to develop next year is the idea of engaging the broader community, the school board, the parents, try to get some community forums on this exact issue. And you know, um, when we talk about controversial issues, there are a whole range of controversial issues out there. You don't have to address every one of them. And I think it would be useful to have a community dialogue that says we much, must teach kids tolerance, we must have them understand respect for people with other viewpoints. Uh, here's a list of uh, six possible issues we could ask our social studies teachers to get into. What does the community think? And you know, maybe it's a place where if you bring up abortion, it'll raise all kinds of terrible um, uh, political issues, so you avoid abortion. Uh, but maybe they'd be uh, willing to talk about gun control or something else, whatever it is. I'm just saying to kind of neutralize this possibility of somebody saying you pick some political issue that is unfair to us and all, let the community decide that and then go into schools and use that as a theme uh, that the teachers can feel comfortable with and they have community support that we've all agreed this should be the way we approach civic education in this school. Donora, imagine that, getting everybody on board. <laughs> imagine that. That's, we're going to work towards that, Michael. But we're ready. We're going to take this across the Civic state. Civic participation has to come from parents as well as students. Exactly. Right. So I think that's the important part of what Michael just said, right? It's like letting the students lead and, and elevating youth voice. I think in this moment, you know, America's having a civic reckoning. We're all grappling with 
what happens when you don't prepare young people for civic participation, or adults for that matter? I can't tell you the number of times I hear people say, can you do GC for adults? Um, I think we have to realize that we have failed our democracy, and I don't mean that in the nerdy sense, and I don't mean to be alarmist, but I think our democracy needs a boost, and the way that we do that is working with, a, across, getting this broad coalition together to be able to reinvigorate civics, and that's the reason we're here. But one of the things that teachers could do, right, to the point of your question in a very simple way is, Generation Citizen came up with this beyond the ballot toolkit. Very simple, six ways all of us, not just young people, not just grown-ups, can get engaged in our democracy. And they're all things we do every day, right? So when I think about what I hear coming out of our classrooms, those 4,500 students that we work with in New York City and as well as 13,000 nationwide and all of our other sites, when we think about what issues come up, I'm gonna, the top four issues, at least in New York City this semester, affordable housing, gun violence, uh, police brutality or police community relations, sexual assault. Those are all the issues that we care about as adults, right? As, be it as a parent, as an educator, whatever you do in your day life. Those are the issues we're reading in the headlines of the newspaper and we're also grappling with solutions to address. As well as segregation, I would add. And, well, especially in this, well, we're a little north of the District 3, but yes, in District 3 on the Upper West Side especially, um, segregation is a huge issue. But I think that's America's fault too, right? I think I'm, I'm being baited to be a little bit more um, edgy. I think that's part of the challenge of not investing in democracy is not being able to talk across divide. And so we now are a society that is uncomfortable having conversations that are uncomfortable, right? Um, you can go online and say, I didn't like what Liz had to say, so I can unfriend her on social media and I never have to hear her opinions again. And that means that we don't know how to talk across the divide, we don't know how to build consensus. And that's the work we're doing in our classrooms, is actually teaching young people that fundamental skill of engaging in conversations and working towards solutions. And so this toolkit, which we have some of them outside, actually just has some common sense ways that we can all go beyond the ballot. have copies to hand yeah, out. We do. <laughs> go beyond the ballot, right? It isn't just about voting. And it is, it's everything that leads up to that. How do we build consensus with our peers who disagree with us? How do we engage, um, you know, attend a political gathering, lobby a decision maker? How can we speak at a community forum and make sure that our voices are heard? We're gonna advocate for action civics. How do we write an op-ed in a local newspaper, actually read the newspaper and be informed? We begin to do those things. We can all, in our classrooms, but also in our society, I think, reboot. That's, those are great pieces of advice. I especially like the part about reading local newspapers. <laughs> um, I would love to open this conversation wait, wait, up to wait, questions. Wait, so, wait, 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 oh, before sorry. you open it up, Please, I go think right ahead. So I just wanted to share, I know you asked for one thing, but I'm gonna give you three very quick. I think the first one is we as a state have a responsibility, and as you heard our chancellor and our Board of Regents members, this is on the forefront, so ESSA, is right front and center for us. It's our new accountability measure. And the fact that we have civic engagement, civic participation as part of our um, ESSA plan is extremely important. That doesn't exist in other states. Two, I think what's important that we are doing at this, to, to echo what, what Michael Rebell was talking about, local level. We have just sent out a survey to all teachers in the state of New York on how we can engage in civic participation and how to increase this type of work throughout the state of New York. And it has to come from the local level. So that has gone out. We're meeting with bipartisan organizations like, uh, like the League of Women Voters, um, gener um, Generation Citizen right here. But I think the, one of the other things that we're exploring and we heard on this panel today is that this area has not been given the importance that it deserves. So we're thinking about a seal that goes on the diploma. So that makes things very different. So I think that we're trying to be very aggressive about how we move this agenda forward. That's great, questions? Um, my question is, first of all, thank you all for being here today, and I completely agree um, with everything, specifically edu civic education being a part of students' everyday life, and so I'm wondering what best practices or tips do you have on really engaging families and parents so that it doesn't just feel like something that happens at school, but it is something that is full circle in students' lives? Who would like to tackle that? Um, we could talk a little bit. So some of the things that we're doing is that we're working with local advocacy groups to really talk about this in the community where it's outside of the school. So one of the, um, one of the examples of that is that we're working very closely with Appleseed to even talk about 
segregation in the schools? How do you have these really in-depth conversations at the local level where it's outside of the school, where it, where it actually happens and plays out in a different way? So we have been giving grants to schools to be able to engage in this type of work. So we're really excited about that. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is DC. I run a nonprofit called The Lamp, and we're a media literacy organization based here in New York City. We have been around since 2007, and our focus has always seen media literacy as a civic engagement tool. And I'd love to hear anybody's thoughts on bringing those two fields together as we're talking about the importance of preparing our youth for democracy. Um, okay, um, you know, when I was talking about the challenge of civic education in the 21st century compared to the 20th century, media literacy is obviously one of the central uh, challenges that has to be met. Um, because uh, the world that kids live in today is social media, is the internet, and most of them, quite frankly, don't know how to use it properly, as, as, I'm, sure, as I'm sure you know. And uh, where are they going to learn to distinguish between accurate and inaccurate um, information? Where are they going to learn to probe a website and see who's behind it and uh, what their uh, tilt is um, if uh, they don't get some kind of objective instruction in school on how to use media, how to use the internet? Um, and, you know, we don't have any standards, we don't have any regulations in this area, we have very little guidance for teachers. I know it's something that state ed is interested in, that people are talking about, uh, but it's clearly an area uh, where uh, we must do and we can do a lot more. I won't be, I agree. Okay. <laughs> can I just add? So we do have something in our standards, so that, that we know that it was just released in September, where it very specifically includes analyzing the source and documents, and, what, and that includes digitally. Because we know that this is something that played out in front of our eyes in the last uh, year and a half to two years. So it is part of our standards that was released in September. So please go see it. I, and what we are going to do is provide resources and how to actually do that. Thank you. Next question. Uh, my name is Betty Holcomb. I'm with the Center for Children's Initiatives, and um, we focus on early childhood. And before I even say what I'm going to say, which Michael's probably anticipating, I just want to give a shout out to Regent Reyes around the incredible work that um, the regents are doing around um, developing um, a solid early childhood approach and the kinds of emphasis they're giving around diversity, multilingualism, emergent language and literacy that's so important to all this. Um, that's just, great. Do you have a question? I do. Just to say that I hope that this conversation will reach down and include early childhood as the foundation tier of all this and that it's kids um, in those early years where they're really learning a lot of the civic, the important lessons, habits, and getting the brain development around this getting along and respecting each other and valuing everybody. So it is more of a comment, but also hoping people can comment on how we Yes. Bring it, include that in this rather than sort of the high school civic participation only. So I'm glad you brought that up because Regent Reyes has been spearheading the early childhood as yeah. well as the civic engagement. And one of the things that's important to know that our framework starts in kindergarten where kids learn about their rights, what they, what they can do about abuse, about what they're entitled to, starts in kindergarten. So if you look at our framework, we started young and we did that intentionally and it was very important for us to start at that level. So you, you will see so that reflected. Pre-K and below, too. So. You will, you'll see it there yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Next question. Hi. Uh, 
I'm, my name is Zaps. I'm from Integrate NYC. We work to bring students together from segregated schools to design solutions for integration. Um, I just want to say thank you all. These moments are really great to be all together, but also the long-term work that you're doing to invest in this. And uh, Salma, I know it's like test time, so thank you for being here. Um, my question is actually not about real integration, our, our platform around integration, but real representation, the kind of parallel, what you were talking about, kind of these twin um, devastations to democracy, the segregated society that we have and the lack of representation and involvement of, our, of our, all of our people in the political process. I'm specifically interested in where we think that students' real decision-making authority can exist. Not just participation, engagement, involvement, input, but actual decision-making power and where you see their decision-making power really growing in the coming years. I think that's a great question. Um, and I would say to you, that's the work that we are spearheading in the classroom, just to build on the last comment, right? So Generation Citizen starts working with students as young as sixth grade. Um, and now there's only this one state mandate that is a one semester participation in government class, if you will. But we, we realize for many seniors, right, that that's too late. They are coming of age in a different way, be it to go off to college or to trade school or f start a career. And if they haven't already been cultivated in that way, it's hard. So to your question around where do we actually think about that common ground, how do we begin to integrate sooner, if you will, and where's the decision making? We see in the classrooms that, especially for our younger students, they can influence decisions in their school building. And when they do, uh, we have one of our assistant principals from the Bronx Academy of Letters on the next panel, uh, Aaron Gary. It's powerful, right, to see the young people actually advocating and calling for a meeting with their local decision maker in their school building. Then that translates to what happens at home, right? We do hear that trickle down or that, cir that circle loop, the feedback loop closing, that they're also using those same civic knowledge and skills in the home, but in their community when they really think about, oh, I actually can influence decisions because they go from having this belief that they have no sense of agency or power especially our most underserved students right because no one's coming to listen to them no one has asked for them um, CNN isn't coming putting it on a town hall for them their US senator or their state representative isn't there but when they finally get that aha moment when they're in the classroom and they're literally in the classroom calling decision makers and someone answers the phone and they get a response right a, a group of young ladies from the Urban Assembly um, a young woman, a women's institute in, Queen, in Brooklyn was just very simple. We want a countdown clock at this dangerous intersection, right? Very real, very tangible. They had been impacted by fatalities or hit and runs in that neighborhood. And their decision maker was the local Department of Transportation. They said, we're gonna call and ask for you to install this countdown clock. We know how much it costs. Can you do it? Here's the evidence for why it matters. When they didn't hear back, they called their local council member and said, not only are you our council member, but you sit on the transportation committee and you have oversight over the Department of Transportation. So we want you to call the borough commissioner and make sure that you get this traffic signal installed. And then they didn't hear back and they called the media. Right? So they're like, mind you, our semester's 10 weeks long. So in a 10 week period, <laughs> these young ladies were at it. And they called the media, they got the media to come to their classroom and film them. And then what did they do? They called the decision maker again and said, did you see our hit in the media? Because we want the countdown clock. And, and they got their countdown clock, but that's when they realized the power of their voice, right? Is when you focus on the local and you make it tangible and accessible. A lot of the systemic change that we see our young people advocating for is gonna take generations to fix. Maybe not the 72 years it took from Seneca Falls to the 19th Amendment, but it's gonna take some version of that in a, you know, in a selectivist environment where we live now. That, this curriculum gives them power to have that local decision making. Yeah, I'd just like to quickly respond to that also because I wanna uh, give some kudos to my colleague Joe Rogers. He's been doing a terrific job with what we call our Know Your Rights campaign. And he goes out to different schools and different uh, youth groups and tells them, you know, the highest court in this state says you have a constitutional right. And it's not just some general vague thing because it's filled in by a lot of good standards that the state education department has implemented to carry out that constitutional right, but nobody knows about it. For example, every school in New York State of a certain size is supposed to have a media literacy uh, specialist, uh, just what we were talking about. And uh, many of our schools in New York City just don't have them. Uh, every school is supposed to have decent facilities, like decent bathrooms, and I think half the schools in New York City uh, must be um, non-compliance on that. You go and tell this to kids. Their eyes open up. What? We have a right to this? We have a right to a decent bathroom? We have a right to instruction in media literacy? Uh, and it really gets them going. So um, these are some of the concrete ways I think we can get kids uh, more involved, let them know that they have rights, and they have power when they use them. These are great examples.
Yeah, so on our school's brag day, we presented about our, the Know Your Rights campaign. And what I thought was really interesting is that even though our school, um, we're all part of the same network, um, they're all the Young Women's Leadership schools, yet our school was, one of, was the only school where we had most of um, these rights. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, adding on to your question about where we see student choice, um, in our district where we have participatory budgeting and you know, our people from our councilman's office come and we, develop, we tell them what we want in our communities and then we get to vote for it. And like last year, us getting, our school got like $200,000 to build a STEAM lab and that was all students voting and mm -hmm. you know, that, felt, that gave them like a ton. These are great examples. Did they fix the bathrooms though? Um, and wait, in our school we have pretty good bathrooms, but <laughs> one of the other schools they had like one bathroom for 500 girls. Yeah, Michael's right about that one. Okay, next question. Hi, I'm, hi. my name is E. I'm a Generation System Program alumni. I want to ask a question in regarding to the content that in school and regarding teacher signing. I want to ask, is it practical to have students and parents sign an agreement contract prior to admission in regarding to the content each that the school teach to students because in my college there a similar thing is in kind of process so i want to ask is it possible in high in below high school to have this kind of system set up in order to have the student and teachers have free stone of speech, and if it does, do the student have their own right to decide whether or not they, they are able to listen or in, if their parent does not allow them to? It's an interesting proposition. So Yi was one of our students uh, last year with us and then participated in our summer internship experience at Community Change Fellowship, which is like a direct pipeline to how do I take these knowledge, this knowledge and skills and apply it to the real world? And so thank you for the question, Yi. It's, it's something we haven't considered before, this notion of a pledge, right? Like how do we actually all commit ourselves to this civic journey and actually reinforcing it for our young people at home. So parents pledging that they're gonna support their students and vice versa. So I think it's something we should definitely think about for the long term, but I wonder if, right? Let's just pursue that train of thought for a second. If we know that in our most underserved communities, you're 30% less likely to have a conversation at, around your dinner table about civics or to be getting an effective civics education classroom in your school, if we had a pledge like that, will we all take democracy a lot more seriously? I would venture to say yes, and so I think that's a great suggestion, Ian, one I want to talk more about with you. Thanks, we have time for one more question. Two more, actually. Oh, oh great. <laughs> You've been waiting so patiently. My name is Peter Goodman. I write a blog Call that in the Apple. Um, the state does a great job of writing a curriculum. There's a ton of material, and they're getting more and more out. But the other side is the learning side. How effective is the curriculum in making change? So does a generation's uh, citizenship, are they tracking these 4,500 students who are in the program? Is there an assessment so as time goes by, we'll know how effective the program is, and if not, why not? Because the other side of teaching and learning, if we're not effective, we have to be reflective and look back and constantly change what we're doing to make it more effective. But this pool of 4,500, I think, is a very rich pool in which we, in which we can learn a lot from. It's a great question. You might have, uh, we recently released a three-year strategic plan to do just that, right? So we're eight, about eight years old, and we, until this day, didn't have that longitudinal study capacity. So part of what we're doing is being able to test that out. Like, actually, if you, you know, put this 10 week long semester in place, get these young people to increase in their civic knowledge and skills, and most importantly, sense of agency, do we see longer out time, uh, better outcomes in the educational system? I will say to you, the challenge for us is, how do we keep track of those students, right? Because they're not our students, they're, they belong to the school, so we are a third party vendor, if you will, of the schools. And so one of the ways that we're beginning to test that longitudinal muscle, if you will, is through our community change fellowship. So we get this pipeline of young people who've been through the classroom, let's say we get, you know, a very small percentage of the ones we serve in the classrooms that come with us over the summer, spend a six week long intensive opportunity. Um, how do we learn about what they do? How do they continue their civic journey in the long term? As we think about our capacity to work with the schools, one of the ways that we've historically done this work is by recruiting college volunteers to go into classrooms and teach alongside experienced teachers. One, because we know it creates this peer to near peer mentor relationship that's powerful, especially for our most underserved students. But two, because it adds capacity in the classroom for the teacher to be doing project-based learning. As we think about scale for the long term and actually getting to the metric 
metrics and the outcomes, we know that we need to be working directly with the teachers because they actually can talk about and begin to track their students long term. We can't work with a sixth grader and get consent from that sixth grader to stay in touch with them for the next six years to know if they went and registered to vote the first time they were offered or did they participate in participatory budgeting when it was in their classroom. And so working with leaders like Aaron, we want to have this deeper saturation point so that we can begin to study that impact over the long term and see that the outcomes that we see over the course of the semester are actually carrying on beyond the classroom, if you will. Final question. Uh, hey, um, so my name is Tausif. I'm from Nyperg. We do a lot of what uh, Generation Citizen does at the college level. We mobilize and uh, organize students to pass laws in New York. And I was wondering, um, you guys all mentioned uh, talking politics in class is a challenge. Um, you guys all acknowledge that. And I was just wondering if you could take a second to um, offer your own guidelines or prescriptions as to how you would navigate that, especially as um, students and people who work uh, in education, even when you talk about something as innocuous as teachers don't have enough resources. Well, the prescription is we should ask the state to fund uh, more money for public higher education. Is that even a conversation we can and should have? So I'm just wondering, what do you guys think about that question? You know, my response to that comes out of one of my own personal experiences that geared me towards civic participation, which is debate. I was very active to debate in high school and college. Um, and what it forces you to do is look at both sides of the question. Mm -hmm. So you can make the question as controversial as you like, or you brought up an example that somebody might say is not controversial. Sure, teachers and schools should have more resources, but you know, there is another side. What's the impact on the state budget? Does it mean if you put more money into schools, there's less money for transportation, for uh, all kinds of other uh, things that have to be decided? Um, so um, when, when kids have to do a debate where they have to take both sides, for me that's the essence of really learning the tolerance that there are two sides to a question, that you have to get evidence that's really good. And by the way, you know, many people have really um, uh, noticed uh, the incredible civic activity of those high school kids from Parkland, Florida, after their tragedy. Um, and uh, they've been the most articulate people standing up for, uh, for uh, positive gun control. Uh, and they and come from I, a well-funded school? Excuse me? They, they come from a well-funded school. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's not only that they were well-funded. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting to me, by the way, there have been, um, I tracked them, something like 38, unfortunately, mass shootings in American secondary schools since Columbine. That was in uh, 19 years ago. This is the only school where the kids have really taken a leadership and done the kinds of things that you would hope that people affected by this would do. And it's what you said, yes, it's an affluent school district, and they're well-funded, and that school district requires every kid to engage in debate and mm -hmm. speech classes. Mm -hmm. uh, so when this happened, they were on CNN the next day. Mm -hmm. It happened that gun control had been their main debate issue for the year. They had researched it. They knew that what they were. T it's, a, it's a really example of what kids can do when they get the proper resources and training. And it's an example of what we want for all of our kids, I would say. Yeah, Michael's right. I heard those students speak last week at a conference mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, and they were amazing. It was so quiet. They were so articulate and passionate, and it was, it was also so painful. I mean, it was tremendous that they had those skills and that they had the knowledge and they knew exactly what they were talking about, and they debated it beautifully. But at the same time, it was unbelievably tragic. Yeah. Sad, yeah. just listening to them. So I, I want to add to that because I'm glad you brought that up because they do have a curriculum about leadership and engagement. So, so unfortunately, when this tragic event took place, they were ready because they have been trained to do that. But at the other end, we have communities that have been disenfranchised, right? That may be having the same debate, but it's heard differently, right? right? So I think we need to engage in that. And one of the things that we are trying to do at the state level is to create this framework of culturally responsive sustaining education so we can have that type of debate. Where do you create agency in students that are not from communities that normally feel like they have that power or have that platform. I think that we can't ignore that and that's at the root of everything we're doing because certain communities are able to move the agenda a lot faster because there's that sense of agency and when you have immigrant communities that engage in this differently, that come from countries where you could lose your life for having these kinds of conversation, I think we need to see this from a different perspective 
if we're really going to talk about what this looks like in America. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for this panel. It was really interesting, and I'm sure you folks will be around to answer more questions. <laughs>